Hello, hello, hello. So welcome back. Um, today we will discuss how to write an op-ed um, to continue with our series of how to write. Um, so I'm really excited about this one because I knew nothing about how to write an op-ed. Tell you the truth, I didn't even know what an op-ed was in, in the sense of uh, what op-ed necessarily stood for. Um, raise your hand if it means opinion editorial. That's what I thought. Um, and it can go, it can go by that. Um, however, it really means opposite the editorial page, which I thought was pretty interesting. Um, and what it is, and I'm going to be looking over at my notes. I have a lot of notes on this. It's a lot of good stuff. Um, so I'm trying to just take the, the highlights and explain to you how to write an, an, an op-ed um, and really the, the most essential pieces of that and understanding the formula behind it. Um, so, But first off, like we start our videos, is why an op-ed? What is an op-ed? Um, so opposite the editorial page is essentially um, the other perspective of whatever the theme of the newspaper or the magazine um, typically has. This is an opportunity for anybody who has an opposite uh, perspective to share their thoughts and really put into words their opinions and explain why and offer evidence, um, solid analysis to support their, what we'll talk about later on, their subjective um, comments and statements. Um, so uh, so it creates this argument in order to persuade. And that's really the ultimate goal here. You're trying to persuade the other side um, to kind of think a little bit from the other side, which is which is which is where you're coming from, um, essentially. So there, again, there's a lot of information. Uh, I'm going to really try to give you the highlights of how to write an op-ed um, and uh, and offer you also um, my example of an op-ed. So if you go where you clicked on this video, if you go up above to where it says writing portfolio and find the op-ed that is posted there for you, which is called Meet Your McVegan. Um, that was my personal op-ed that I wrote. Um, and just a little bit of background on that, I am actually plant-based, plant um, have not had, have not eaten any meat since 2000, oh, I wanna say 2014, I think, with my husband. Um, and so I wanted to challenge myself in the sense of in, in writing an op-ed from the perspective of the other side to me. So since I am plant-based and I don't eat meat, I found an article that was on uh, the new McVegan burger. Um, and essentially I am writing for why the McVegan burger is is not good for your health when when I actually think the opposite. Um, but it was a good opportunity to uh, really create my analysis and see the other side's perspective because it's often too easy to, to really make our own argument and we can get lost in a lot of emotion and a lot of uh, just personal belief. So I wanted to keep it more um, to the formula and really follow that with the evidence. Um, and I'm really glad that I did that because I really did find good information and good data to support the subjective statements that I made in order to create my middle of my of my op-ed as you will see when you follow. So now that we know what an op-ed is, um, editorials offer opinions in the name often of the other side but also corporations or agencies um, and, and so on. And often what we don't know also is that newspapers and magazines like controversial pieces. So they might be looking for a an op-ed that offers the opposite um, perspective. So they're actually pretty intriguing in that sense. Um, now, one of the pieces of, of advice that I got from, from Professor Long and that I really, really liked was find opportunities, places where you swim upstream. So 
uh, you are the one going against what the typical audience of that newspaper or magazine reads. You're going against what they feel comfortable with, the ideas that they are comfortable with and that they like. Um, and you are doing that by not just giving them an opinion, but you are substantiating that with, with facts and data. So it's actually a, a beautiful thing. Um, Op-ed is the least read thing, um, but often the most valuable because it makes people think. So um, take advantage of that. Um, just some tips, uh, 1,200 words is a usual cutoff. Um, so you really have to focus on, on your evidence being to the point and not going on and on. Um, and once you see the, the formula, essentially, it's a five-paragraph um, article, uh, you can see how that it's it's not hard to to stay within those twelve hundred. Um, the other piece of advice is before we even start is build a case on evidence. And like I said earlier, um, it's hard to do if you're passionate about something and it's heavily based on emotion. So forget that. Build your case on evidence on actual data and know that it's going to be taken apart but the, by those who don't feel the same way that you do. So offer hard facts that they cannot argue with, that they cannot um, disagree with because they're just, their data, their statistics. And again, that supports your, your opinion. Um, very few people approach the op-ed technically because it is, in a sense, an opinion. But if you do approach it technically, and stick to the formula and stick to to that evidence it is a lot more effective so keep that in mind now how do we open an op-ed um it's with what we know as a as a uh ppp a triple p i call it but first we have the peg um which is the the recent news item it's one sentence um, it is last Friday, in my case, if you're looking at my Meet Your McVegan, it says last Friday McDonald's announced a 100% plant-based burger to be released in Finland this month. You are taking that straight from um, your source uh, and, and you're offering the time, the date, whatever it is. Um, and then you follow that with your problem. So in my case, you have this new soy patty on a quarter pound and but quarter pounder bun comes as a result of increasing demand for meat-free plant-based options in response to a growing vegan trend, which is what I called it. Um, so that's, that's the problem. This is a trend. Uh, this is a response to this trend. Um, and then you go into your promise, which must include the word should or must, uh, because this is where you, you, you propose you you propose to fix the problem essentially. Um, ought is another word uh, that you can use. So things like the industry should, citizens should contribute or should hold back. The president should. It's also one sentence. And in my case, we have vegans and anyone contemplating veganism must learn about healthier diets that include animal protein rather than commit to an incomplete diet due to a temporary craze. So that is your promise. You are about to explain why they must learn about a healthier diet um, and not just because you feel like it or because you think it's right. Uh, you're going to offer evidence for why they must learn. They must learn the other side. Um, so that is one of the... Um, the most straightforward ways to really approach that first paragraph. Um, also, we're looking, I think I mentioned earlier, uh, at a five-paragraph article. So you have your opening, then you're going to have three paragraphs um, with evidence, and then you're going to have your closing. Um, so I'm actually scrolling down my notes because there is a lot of information, but and it's all great, um, but we move on to... The middle. Once we have the peg problem promise, we move on to the middle um, where we talk about where we offer a subjective um, statement. That's how we open it up. Um, 
So for example, we have an impressive record of growth in Western Europe over the last 14 quarters. Well, that obviously doesn't offer any evidence yet. It's just an opinion. It's just a, it's just a thought. In my case, I, I write adults require approximately point, um, I'm sorry. Um, this is, Okay, so hold on, I'm sorry. Let me go down to one of my subjective sentences. Those who fall for the vegan fad momentarily return to an animal protein diet. You're not quite, I'm not quite explaining why yet, um, but I am making a statement by saying that those who fall for this vegan fad or trend momentarily often return to an animal protein diet. So it is implied that there are reasons for why they return to an animal protein diet, and then that is followed up with the evidence. So five out of six people who give up meat eventually abandon their vegetarian ways. Okay, so now we have numbers backing up this subjective statement that I opened up the paragraph with and explaining and explaining why they return to a an animal protein diet. Um, that's followed by yet another statistic of 70% of vegans eventually return to eating meat. So now we know that 70% of vegans eventually return to eating meat. And then we go into former President Bill Clinton gave up all animal products after undergoing a quadruple bypass in 2004, but by 2014 Clinton was back to eating animal products in moderation. Um, testimonials are a good way of showing that evidence, um, data, like I mentioned earlier, um, and let's see, I'm about to give you more that I have here on, on the evidence. So anecdotes, personal exper experience, like I just, uh, or I could have said I returned to an animal protein diet as well due to my failing health. And, and here's, here are the stats, here are the reasons. Um, statistics are, kinds of evidence, facts, history, step-by-step uh, -step logic, if you can, if you can um, incorporate that somehow. Case studies are very good as well, and also your credentials. So if I were an expert in the field, I could actually, actually, actually offer up some um, information based on experience. Um, so the beauty of this is that all three of your middle paragraphs will follow the very same format, and that is your subjective statement followed by your evidence statement. And so you have the topic, and then that's followed by point one, point two, and point three. Um, and then you move on to your other. So. So one thing to keep in mind is know the difference between subjective and objective um, when it comes to really creating that first sentence of your middle paragraphs followed by your objective sentences that contain the evidence and the facts and, and all those things that I called evidence earlier. Um, so and normally you're good with evidence item number one evidence item number two, and then more evidence as desired and obviously as relevant to that point one. Um, so let's go down to my third paragraph where it states, eliminating the vitamin B12 found only in animal protein can lead to unhealthy muscle tissue and a myriad of deficiencies that can lead to serious health problems. Um, Okay, that's subjective. That's what I believe. But then I have facts about what vitamin B12 actually does for your body. Hence, why it is so important to eat that animal protein because that vitamin B12 is only in, in animal protein. Um, and then last, um, you have your last paragraph where you restate your remedy. Uh, it contains a restatement of the remedy and issue a call of action. It tends to be short, tends to be to the point, and it should be. Um, and, and it has to be something that people can grasp when they read. Uh, it's, it's not only you've already provided the evidence, you've already provided the why and the, the problem, obviously, at the beginning. 
Um, this is just a call to action. They could do, do this better if they did this. So my last paragraph for the closing says, anyone contemplating veganism or already a vegan needs to educate themselves on the benefits of healthier diets that include animal protein. So that ties directly to that first paragraph where I made a proposal. Don't sacrifice your health or the health of your children in the name of a fad. Um, prevent unrepairable health damage by eating sufficient animal protein to keep your body energized, your mind sharp, and your spirit happy. Um, so that closes everything, all my thoughts into into one. It's it's to the point and um, and addresses that that problem and and the proposal that we that we talked about from the beginning. Um, so as far as general advice and content, focus on one issue or idea. Use facts, 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 not I feel or I think. Have a clear and well-defined point of view. Know where you stand. Choose a topic that is timely and newsworthy. Start with a new peg, so don't use something from three or four weeks ago. It's just not relevant anymore. Your first paragraph should be tight and brief, so have that, that peg problem and promise. And then express your opinion, back it up with factual research and information. Um, another general piece of advice would be be personal and conversational, but not chatty. Um, so relate to your reader somehow. Use clear, direct, and powerful language and appeal to the average reader. So again, relate to them. This is a problem. This can affect you. This can affect your neighbor. This can affect your children um, in the future. Now, don't focus on low-hanging fruit, so easy things that everybody's all emotional about and, and um, up in arms about. So just very logical uh, topics. Um, never use sarcasm. That's just really hard to read uh, when you're not listening to tone. So avoid that. Don't use sarcasm, rather. Um, educate the reader, but don't be preachy or condescending. So approach it in a very respectful manner offer and the other side and offer the reasons why and the evidence um overall you may want to explain everything but readers don't have the time so stick with what has the most value and pick a well-defined topic and a few key sub points um or else it's going to be very easy to kind of go down a rabbit hole which i actually did on one of my first um, papers um, just because it gets so interesting that you just want to go down every rabbit hole that you find and it doesn't make for a good op-ed. Um, so uh, I hope that that gives you an idea and I hope that the that the op-ed that I have up on my page helps in tightening up everything that I said in the video um, and I appreciate your attention. Have a good day. Until the next one.